Today I'm going to take a look at this little product here that I'm hoping will solve one of my main gripes I've had with my AV setup in the living room. A while back you'll notice I got a Mac Mini and it works really well apart from one issue I've found and that is if I turn the Mac Mini on with the AV receiver and TV switched off the Mac Mini just won't output video so in order to get video out of the Mac Mini I've got to turn the TV and receiver on first let the TV sit on the no signal screen and then turn the Mac Mini on and then it works fine. I suspect it's due to the file vault encryption because the Mac Mini popped up the file vault screen on boot to ask for the password before it'll decrypt and then start up and it seems as though if it's not got a a, the TV powered on it just doesn't detect the resolution and doesn't output video correctly. And I've seen a couple of reports online with people saying the same thing. That's quite annoying and I've also had a little a couple of times where I've gone away and switched the TV off and left the Mac Mini on and I've come back a few hours later turned the TV on and the Mac Mini stops outputting video and the only way to fix it is to hard power it down holding the button and turn it on again. And it's been driving me mad and it's one of those things that's it's never pushed me really to fix it but I finally decided right I'm going to try this little thing and see if it fixes it. And the reason I'm making this video is that this box might also be extremely useful for people who are doing other things not just trying to fix the Mac Mini. It's almost like a Swiss army knife for HDMI stuff and it's really cheap so let's take a look at it. So it's just a very generic box with an Outlook.com email address on top so that seems reputable but we'll take a look at what we get. So as you can see there's a little adapter there and it's made by a brand called Easy Coo, never heard of them, but Easy Coo, and the model number of this is the EZ EX11 HAS Pro. And it's listed on Amazon as an HDMI 2.0 audio extractor, but it's a lot smarter than just a basic audio extractor. So we'll take that out there, take a look at that in a second, take a look at what else we get. We get a micro USB cable, that's for power, and also apparently firmware update, but I can't actually find firmware online, so. I don't know if you can firmware update it, but that's the USB cable there. I'll do a tear down of this as well later and see what it actually contains. A little push pin thing for like pressing a reset button. It's got a little hole in it for like updates with a button in it to hold down. So I think this puts it into like an update mode, but again I can't find the firmware, so I suspect it's for that. And then we get the manual, which should Yeah, it's just a sort of I think it just explains some of the stuff it supports and different modes it has. But that's all fairly boring. So let's take a closer look at the actual adapter itself, see what it can do, and I'll explain why I'm going to try and use this and why I think it might fix my problem. Okay, so here we have the adapter. And if you look at the top, it says HDMI, HDMI 2.0 repeater, scaling and audio. So while it's advertised just as an audio extractor, it does a lot more than that. We can see up here it has HDMI 2.0 compliance, so that means it'll do full 4K60, which is what I need. HDR support, I'll need that. Audio de-embed, so that's how it's extracting the audio. And HDCP 2.2 compliant. And EDID. And that's why I bought this, is the EDID emulation. Now, for people who don't know, and I'll try and go quite quickly through this, with HDMI, you've got protocols such as EDID. What this does is it, is it carries display information down the HDMI cable. So when you plug your TV into a device, your TV can, or monitor can then send a signal to the, to the device to say what resolutions it supports, what modes it supports, what the default resolution should be, and stuff like that. And what I suspect my problem is, is that with the TV and receiver switched off, when I turn the Mac Mini on, it's not getting that information, so it doesn't know what video resolution and stuff to output, and therefore doesn't display anything on the TV. This device doesn't just, isn't just compatible with it. It can actually emulate EDID modes, which are configured by these dip switches on the back here. And what that means is that even without a display connected, this can pretend to almost be a display and send information to the Mac Mini saying, I support these resolutions, you can output this to me. And I'm hoping that having this plugged in and permanently switched on, because it'll just be plugged into USB, will mean that when I turn the Mac Mini on, even if the TV and receiver are switched off, this will hopefully emulate a display, get the Mac Mini to start outputting video, and then when I turn the TV on, it will then the video will then pass through to the TV. So that's why I bought this, is it has this EDID support, which we'll take a look at later. Apart from that, it's a pretty nice little device. Feels very well, well built, it's metal. We'll take it to a full teardown later. And on one side we can see we have some ports. So we have the HDMI out, so that'll go off the TV. And then we've got an audio output for a stereo 3.5mm jack or optical. So this is the main sort of advertised use case of this, is to act as an audio extractor. So you could use this to send 
route an HDMI signal through it and send audio out to another set of speakers, which is quite useful, but it's not what I'm going to be using it for here. But yeah, you can use that as well. You've got a little update button there, but again, that doesn't seem to really do anything. Next up on the other side, you've got the inputs. So you've got HDMI in, so that's where I'll plug the Mac Mini in. You've got power slash firmware, so that's the power over USB you'll need to provide, and also apparently some sort of firmware, up, firmware update. I'll try plugging that into a PC and see what I get. And then you get the set of dip switches, which are labeled setting. And if you look on the bottom, or in the manual, these are all detailed. So the first one here we can see is setting slash position one to two. And the first one it says is normal mode or test mode for the first switch. Now that's very vague. In the manual it goes into more detail and says HDCP compatible. Now I'm not going to try and do any dodgy copy protection bypassy stuff, but I'm just wondering if that's some sort of either it enabling HDCP or some dubious thing we won't really go into. But yeah, that's what position one is. I'll let people figure that out themselves. Position two is labeled scalar setting. And that's something really cool that this has. It has a built-in 4K to 1080p scalar. So you can see there, position two is labeled when it's off, it's just in pass-through mode, it just outputs 4K. But if you switch that position there, that second switch down, it will scale 4K to 1080p. And that could be incredibly useful. For example, with my AV receiver, I've got two outputs, but they always output the same resolution. So if I wanted to have a 4K TV connected and a 1080p TV connected, I couldn't output both because what it would either do is output 1080p to both TVs or output 4K to the 4K TV and then output 4K to the 1080p TV and it wouldn't support it. With this, you can switch position two down and that will enable a scaler and that will scale the 4K input to 1080p output. So that's why I'm saying this is almost like a multi-tool. It's got a little feature like that that is just going to be incredibly useful. Just have one of these around, and if you find that you need to scale a 4K source down to 1080p, you can just do that. Now, the only downside I'll see with, say with that is I did briefly try it out. It works fine, and I'll demonstrate it, but it doesn't seem to convert HDR to non-HDR. So if you've got like a, a modern 4K TV that's using HDR, that scaler will convert to 1080p HDR. So if you're connecting it to a source that doesn't support that HDR input, it won't work. So you would need to turn off HDR potentially, but it will at least let you scale the resolution, which could be quite good. And then finally, you've got the rest of the positions, which are for the different EDID modes. And they're all detailed here. So this is what, when you, so when you, what's what you do with this, is with, with these three pins here, you pick the EDID or the display type that you want this to almost pretend to be. So with all these in the off position, which is up, it's set to copy EDID. That means it'll take the EDID information from the TV that's connected and just pass it st straight through. I'll try this one out because that might just be enough to back fix my problem, but if not, there's other options as well, where you can pick different types of displays to emulate. So you've got one 1080p option, so it's 1080p 3D two-channel HDR. So that's the type of audio it does as well. Or you can emulate 4K 420 mode, so you've got 420 or 444 color spaces. You can do different channels for audio, so you can have two channel, six channel, eight channel, two channel with 444 HDR, Dolby Atmos, or you can go all the way up to 4K60, 444 color space, eight channel HDR. So you can pick the type of display you want this to emulate. Now, in my case, as I said, I'm going to try it on copy, but if not, what I'll probably end up doing is switching these all down to the bottom position, which would emulate this, which would emulate a 4K60 display, 444 color space, eight, ch eight channel audio HDR, which is what I've essentially got with my setup. So yeah, that's it there. And it does just seem like such a useful little device to have because while I'm buying it for the EDID emulation, if I ever need a device to scale, t scale a 4K source down to 1080p or I want to extract audio from HDMI, I can just grab this and use it. This brand also do other options like this. They do one that's a splitter, so rather than having the audio output, it's got two HDMI outputs and you can scale those independently. So that could be another option. It just didn't have as, as, as many EDID related options, so I didn't get that one instead. But this brand, if you look at their stuff, they do seem to have quite a few different scalers and splitters and distribution amplifiers and stuff for HDMI. But they all seem to have a few additional features that you wouldn't normally expect that could make them really useful. And of course, the final feature is the repeater. So this could be the simplest thing, is just if you've got a really long cable run, you could put this in the middle of it, power it, and it'll repeat the signal and allow it to go over a longer distance. Now, I've also tried that repeater functionality, 
and it also works really well. I've been able to put a five meter cable in, a five meter cable out, and I get a perfect signal at the other end. Whereas coupling those two cables together without this in the middle would cause the signal to drop out. So it definitely seems to work as a repeater if you're running it over a long run. And in fact, I actually bought this to use as a repeater and I'm using it for something else. And I also bought this other official HDMI 2.0 Ultra HD repeater. And this one is actually advertised officially as a repeater. And it literally doesn't work. It works worse than using a coupler. So this is actually like it works really well as a repeater, whereas an actual repeater does not work as a repeater, apparently. So I'll be returning that one. But yeah, you've also got the repeater functionality, so you can run it over a long run. And as I keep mentioning, this is just a sort of ideal thing just to have sitting around. So if you ever need to repeat a signal, scale a signal, extract audio, it will do it. So what we'll now do is we'll go away and try it out. See if it works and see if it solves my problem. Okay, so now let's try this out. So here's my setup here. I've shown this many times before. But what we've got is we've got the Mac Mini. That then connects into my AV receiver with an HDMI cable straight from the Mac Mini to the receiver into one of its inputs. And then the output of this receiver goes into a wall plate through an HDMI cable that runs through the wall and into the TV, which is a 4K TV. And first of all, what I'll do is I'll demonstrate it working and then we'll demonstrate the issue. So if I were to turn the mains power on, I'm doing a full power up from nothing. So the mains power is now on. And then I turn the TV on. The TV comes on. The receiver will then start itself up automatically because of HDMI CEC. And it switched to the Mac Mini input. You might be able to see it on the screen or it might be a bit washed out. And if I wait for all this to turn on, so that the TV then comes up and displays the Denon screen, which you might not be able to see based on the angle, but it's just displaying a Denon logo from the receiver saying that it's not got an input. Now, if I do that, then I turn the Mac Mini on. It'll chime. The TV will then flicker about a little bit and the Mac Mini will start up. And there we go, the Mac Mini is now at the file vault screen asking me to put in a password. So it is starting up correctly, as you can see there. But now let's turn this off and replicate the problem. So I shut the Mac Mini down, turn the TV off, that turns the receiver off, and then turn the mains power off. That's now all turned off, and then we'll try again, but powering it up in a different order. So I'm going to turn power on there, leave everything here switched off, and turn the Mac Mini on first. So the Mac Mini is now chimed, and I'll wait a couple of seconds just to let it boot up to what would be that screen. And now what I'll do is turn the TV on. As before, TV turns on, receiver turns on, receiver switches to the Mac input. And now the TV will permanently sit on this no signal screen. And even if I, if I were to like move the mouse, click buttons on it, the TV will never switch off of that screen. It's maybe hard to make it on camera, but you can see the no signal thing in the bottom corner. So that's not working. And then the only way to fix it is to like hard power down the Mac Mini using the button on the back. And then turn it on again once this is back sitting on the Denon screen without that no signal message. And this is obviously really annoying. So what I need to do Let's put this little box in place and see if we can fix it. Okay, so now I've got this device in place. So I've just got it plugged in here. The cable that used to go straight into the back of the Mac Mini is now plugged into the output on this, and that goes up to the receiver. And I've put this new cable in that goes from this into the Mac Mini, and that goes into the input on this device. Then for power, I've just plugged a micro USB cable into this and then into the back of my satellite box just to get power because the Mac Mini's ports are all full, so this had a convenient power source. That's one thing to bear in mind, is this does require external power. Some HDMI splitters, they are, with, with some splitters, the external power is optional and they can power themselves over the HDMI, but this one doesn't need that external power, but that's fine. And then I've just left all the dip switches in the off position, which means it should copy the EDID information from the TV, so I shouldn't need to actually set a specific setting, but I could change that if it doesn't work. But what we'll do is we'll put that there and we'll try it out. So I'm going to first of all do the test that I did that definitely did work. So I'm just going to check if I've not broken it. So I'm going to turn the mains on. 
Then I'm going to turn the TV on. The receiver will come on automatically. And now that the receiver is on, we'll turn the Mac Mini on. Now, one thing I spotted is that before this was in place, when the Mac Mini was switched off and the receiver was turned on, I would get the Denon logo would come on the TV. But now with this device in place, the TV just displays its own no signal message. So I think that's maybe because this is now emulating a display, so the Denon is now seeing a, an input going into it, so it's not displaying its own no signal display. But that's fine. So in theory, if we turn the Mac Mini on, it will chime. And it'll come up on the TV. So the Apple logo comes on. A couple of seconds, we get the file vault screen. Now, admittedly, that's not surprising. That's what it used to do. But it shows that I've not broken it, at least by putting this in line. So what we'll now do is we'll shut it down again, turn everything off, and do the test that previously didn't work to see if this has actually fixed my problem. So turn TV off. Receiver turns off as well. And we'll turn off the mains to everything. And now let's try it in the opposite order that previously didn't work. So this time, we'll turn the mains power on, leave the TV and everything switched off, and then turn the Mac Mini on now. The Mac Mini's chimed. I'll wait a few seconds, at which point it would normally be booting up to the file vault screen. And now this time, if this has worked, when I turn the TV on, the file vault screen should come up, rather than just that black screen. Let's turn the TV on there. TV comes on, receiver turns on, and hopefully, there we go, file vault screen. So that has actually fixed my problem. Putting this in line now means that I can turn the Mac Mini on before I turn the TV on, and it actually works. And that's excellent because this is going to save me so much time, just because the number of times I would come over here, turn the mains on, turn the Mac Mini on, then walk over to the couch, turn the TV on, not get an output and go, oh, it's happened again, and have to turn it all off and then restart it, and it just became a total pain. And what I'm also hoping with this, and I'll need to obviously come back at the end and validate if that's actually helped, but what I'm hoping is this also solves that issue where I would turn the TV off, go away for a while, come back, and then find the Mac Mini stopped outputting video while I was away with the TV switched off. And I suspect it will, because this will now almost pretend to the Mac Mini that there's always a display connected. So yeah, that's a very neat little device, and it seems to definitely fix my problem. So that's pretty excellent. So now as another test, I've plugged it in at the other end, in line between the, between the output of the receiver and the TV. So it's now hidden down the back here. You can maybe see that on camera. But yeah, it's just hidden in the back here. And what I'm going to do here is just demonstrate the other modes with those dip switches. Just because it's easier to show them both in the same shot here. Now, one thing I will point out though, after putting this in line between the TV and the output of the receiver, this doesn't pass audio return channel or ARC. Now it does pass CEC, so the command, the HDMI control stuff. So you turn the TV on, the receiver turns on, the TV's remote will operate the receiver's volume and all that sort of stuff still works. But audio coming from the TV, so whether it's live TV or one of the smart apps, no longer passes down to the receiver. So that is important to bear in mind with this. While it does support CEC, it doesn't support ARC. However, with, with that in line, I've got it set in the same settings it was with the receiver, with, with the other ends where it's just all those dip switches off and it's set to copy the EDID. And as you can see, it shows up on the TV. The TV is receiving a, 4, a 4K signal, so if we press this button there, we get the full 4K resolution. And if you look under the Mac, we can go into the scaled option here and we can see that it goes all the way up to 3840 by 2160. So the Mac itself is also outputting that, 10, that 4K signal to the TV. Now let's change those dip switches. So the first one I'm going to do is just the EDID emulation. On this, most of the modes are all 4K, but there's one 1080p mode. So if I enable that 1080p mode on this, which is by setting dip switch 5, yes, yeah, setting dip switch 5 to the off position, this will now emulate a 1080p screen instead of this at the screen that's actually a 4K screen. So we switch that dip switch, which is very fiddly to do. There we go. The TV cuts out. Takes a few seconds to resync itself and figure itself out. And now it's coming up 
and the TV is displaying a 1080p signal. And if you look at the video screen settings here on the Mac and go down to Scaled, you can see the Mac itself is also outputting a 1080p resolution where the only options are below 1080p. There's no 4K resolution option, in the, option now. So the Mac Mini is now being tricked to think it's actually connected to a 1080p screen instead of a 4K one, so it only outputs that 1080p signal. This could be useful potentially if you're having issues where like you want it to run at 1080p but it's defaulting to 4K and then your cable can't handle 4K or something like that. So this could be quite useful. I've also noticed that there's now no longer an HDR option here. Don't know what's doing that. Does the EDID say HDR on it? Yeah, the EDID option does say HDR, but it's maybe a different type of HDR. So yeah, the HDR options also disappear switching that mode on. Now, if we turn that back off again, so we now put it to copy EDID, like that, it's now gonna go back to how it was working before. So the TV's EDID information has been passed through to the Mac Mini, so it sees the 4K screen, outputs the 4K resolution again, and as before, it's now got the full 4K setting on the Mac. The Mac is now seeing a 4K screen as well. Now the final option this has is the scaler. So what we can do with that is if we enable the scaler by finding what option it is, it is dip switch two to off. So we split that little dip switch there. Like that, we've now enabled the scaler. So what you can see here is the TV is seeing a 1080p signal, but if you look at the Mac, it actually is still outputting a 4K signal. So the Mac's now outputting 4K and it's being scaled by that little box behind here to send the TV a 1080p signal. Now the one thing I have found is the colours do look a little bit wa more washed out with this, but that might be the Mac's HDR. So if I turn the HDR off on the Mac, that might look different. That looks a little bit better. Yeah, the colours look a little bit washed out using the scaler. It's maybe not quite as good as if it was like actually set to 1080p obviously, or potentially if my receiver was scaling it, it might be a bit better. But that is still extremely useful because if you're in a setting, like I mentioned earlier, where you've got something that can output two outputs, but they're the same resolution and you need to scale it down to a lower resolution display, this could be a very useful option to have. And having it in such a cheap device, it's actually marketed as an audio extractor. It's pretty neat to have. So you flip that back up there, switch the scaler off and now it's outputting, the TV's outputting the 4K resolution. That's really cool as well. Definitely a very versatile little device. Okay, so now I'm back after trying that out and I'm so pleased that this fixed my problem. And it does just seem like such a useful device because not only did it fix my EDID issue, but if you were having other issues and you wanted to actually set an EDID or use that scaler, it's got all of that. I also did just try the audio output. I didn't bother like, actually demonstrating it on video, but it does work and the sound quality actually seems pretty good. I plugged it into my studio monitors and had it so I could switch the audio output through the PC easily between the HDMI output, which is going through this and then into my speakers, or through the actual my actual audio interface and into my speakers. And yeah, the audio interface maybe sounded like a tiny little bit better, at least in my testing, but it didn't sound bad at all, this. And it, it wasn't like, you know, I was worried you'd, you'd hear like static in the background or anything like that. There was no issues there at all. So yeah, it does seem pretty good for that. I've not tried the optical output though, so just bear that in mind. Now, the other thing I also tried, it was just to see what this firmware update stuff does. And it's given me a little bit of insight into maybe what's inside this. Because when you plug it in normally, it doesn't do anything, it just powers it. But if you plug it, if you hold down this update button with a pin and then plug it in, it actually shows up under your operating system as a device. And that device name is the GD32 USB DFU NFS mode. That's what this shows up as. And then Googling GD32, that brings up the, G the Giga device GD32 microcontroller, which seems to be a sort of pin compatible alternative clone sort of thing that's apparently faster of the very popular STM32 microcontroller. So we'll pop this open now and see what's inside it, but I suspect we'll find some sort of, well, some gigabit device GD32 microcontroller in here. So I suspect there's nothing special in terms of like configuring this or flashing firmware. You know, it doesn't show up as like a, I was wondering if it like show up as a drive that had a context value configure. It doesn't do anything like that. I think literally the idea would be that you plug it in and actually just flash the firmware on totally raw. That does beg the question though, like how hackable this could be because, you know, if it does, I don't, I don't know if it's maybe got like a standard HDMI IC in it that's then controlled by the microcontroller. Could you write your own firmware for this if it's just STM32 based? I wonder.
But anyway, let's pop this open and see what's inside. It's actually very easy to take apart, there's just two screws on each side, so it's not like some sort of thing that's clipped shut, it's actually going to be quite easy to open. Let's pop these screws out. Obviously it's fairly pointless opening this, but just interested to see what's in here, see what sort of capabilities it has. So, pop that open, pop that out, and the board just drops out. And there's a little board we've got there. So yep, we've got a few different chips, obviously we've got the HDMI input and output, the audio stuff, a little chip there, only getting closer and actually look at model numbers. We've got this chip here that has the ARM logo, so that's clearly our microcontroller. And this chip here, which is labelled GS Cool Link, GS Cool Link, something like that, GSV2002. So I suspect this is the main HDMI IC that's doing all the work. And then this little microcontroller here can interface with that and control it. So yeah, what I'll quickly do is I'll run away off camera, look up some of these model numbers to see what they are and see if I can get any more detail. And I'll come back and just talk about how this works and what it contains. Okay, so I've now gone away and looked at some of these chips and worked out sort of what it has. So, as I mentioned before, this is the main microcontroller, which is a Giga device GD32E103. That's one of the microcontrollers out of their GD32 line, and it's based on an ARM Cortex M4F, up to 120 megahertz. Nothing particularly fancy, it doesn't really matter about the full specs, you can look it up with that number though. And what this seems to be doing is just controlling everything. This doesn't do any video processing. This just controls this chip here. So what it'll be doing is it'll be handling the input from these dip switches here. It'll also take firmware over this here. It might be able to read data off of this chip. I'm not sure. I suppose it must might be able to if it can copy the EDID. And yeah, that's just a little old control chip. So it's not really doing anything processing wise. All the processing is done by this chip here, which is a GS Coolink GS, G, GSV2002. Now I've looked this up and there's not a huge amount of information, but I've put up a little diagram on your screen that I found on the, Giga, on the GS Coolink website. And this seems to be like an HDMI switcher splitter type chip. It seems quite versatile. So it's actually, according to this block diagram, has two HDMI inputs and two HDMI outputs. So you can probably use this in like an HDMI splitter or you can use it in like a switcher where you can switch different inputs to different outputs, do matrix switching, stuff like that but it also lists that it supports audio extraction, which is what we're doing here. Also audio insertion, so maybe the opposite, obviously probably won't support it in this particular configuration. And it also states that it supports downscaling, which is why it's got that scalar feature, which is really cool. Now, interestingly in this block diagram, it does show CSC 420 to 444 dither downscaling, which sounds like some sort of color space conversion with dithering, but I couldn't get that working. What I did is I tried putting a 4K HDR source out my receiver into it and then plugged my like cheap a cheap little projector into the output and scaled it down to 1080p and the projector wouldn't get a signal. So I suspect that was because of like the HDR output setting. So maybe it won't downscale HDR or maybe it will. It's maybe one of those things that's just really you have to be lucky with it. But yeah, that's a little chip there. Seems like a pretty powerful little thing. So obviously they're using it here just to extract audio and just to um do the scaling and EDID emulation, but this could on the other hand be used in a splitter, it could be used in a matrix switch, and I wouldn't be surprised if a bunch of other products from EasyCo would contain the same chip, because they do a splitter that looks very similar to this, it just has less EDID modes. I wouldn't be surprised if that uses the same chip, they could use this in so many different devices, it seems a really flexible little chip. So that's it there. The final thing of note, well actually the other thing of note is there is like a serial header, a serial header here, a header here labelled RST, so that's presumably reset, and one here labelled OPO, so I don't know what that is. But I suspect this is maybe some sort of debug programming type header for the microcontroller. Again, not really much use if you're just using this. But you, I wonder how hard it would be to actually like write your own firmware for this little thing, given you can probably flash it over USB. The final real component of note is just under here. There's this little chip here, which is labelled 344C. And I've looked this up online, and that seems to be a Cirrus Logic DAC. So that'll be doing the, DAC, the digital analog conversion. So I presume this chip here produces a digital audio signal. And then that either goes to the optical connection here, or it goes to this DAC, which then converts to analog for the 3.5mm output. It's interesting to see that this is apparently, or at least 344C, is a Cirrus Logic part, because that's a proper brand, and I was expecting this to be a lot cheaper. Now, it could be, I don't know if they maybe make knockoffs of those Cirrus Logic DACs or anything, but yeah, the DAC model is 344C, and that's obviously what it's using for this 3.5mm output. And it didn't sound terrible. 
So yeah, that's it there. So all I need to do is pop it back together and we'll talk about it. But yeah, this thing does seem really pretty good. So yeah, I'm very happy with this little device. It was surprisingly cheap. I mean, 30 quid isn't super cheap, but for something that does all the EDID emulation and scaling that this has, and to have so many features in one box, that isn't too bad. And it's the sort of thing you could definitely, as I mentioned earlier, buy as like a multi-tool. Just have one of these sitting around, and if you ever have an HDMI issue where you need to scale a signal, set EDID emulation, you know, just repeat a signal, extract audio, you've got the little box that can do that, and you can just have this as a spare little thing. And obviously that solved my issue with my Mac Mini perfectly. So likewise, if you're having the same issue as me, and you've got a Mac Mini and an AV receiver, and it's just not working properly, when you're turning it on, especially if you're using file vault, because I think that's part of the issue, chucking one of these in line definitely seems to help. So yeah, there you go. Thank you very much for watching. If you're interested in buying this, there's links in the description. And I'll also put a link to like, the EasyCoo store, just because they do a lot of other products like this, just with slightly different inputs, slightly different outputs, splitters, different things like that, matrix switches. But they all seem to have one thing in common, and that is that while they do do the feature that they state, like an audio extractor or split the signal or things like that, they all seem to have additional little features around setting EDID mode, scaling, just a lot of little tweaks that seem really useful. For example, there's one of these that takes one HDMI input, splits two outputs, and you can switch the scaler on individually on each of the outputs, which seems really neat. So yeah, they do a lot of very interesting devices, I'll put links down in the description. But yeah, thanks for watching.